morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jason Clark. Um, I work at New Relic, although that has nothing to do with this talk today. So this is uh, something else entirely. Before I get started, I, I have a, a quick little story and a request for you all. Uh, so back in college, uh, one of my best friends, I actually known him since I was like five years old, um, we had one class together the whole time, and it was a software engineering class. And my friend Mike, is a, he's a funny guy. He's kind of quirky. He's got hes a lot of fun to be around. But the, the funny thing that he did in this software engineering class was he introduced a concept that he called the learning chicken. And any time that the professor said something that he felt like was particularly profound, he would balk like a chicken. Okay, now the, it, this, go with me on this, but I, I loved this. This was so much fun. It took, you know, it just took this software engineering class that could have been kind of dry and just sort of like, you were waiting for that moment when Mikey was gonna balk like a chicken. <laughs> and, and it helped, so I thought that I would bring that forward. I thought that I would, I would introduce all of you to the learning chicken. So today, during this talk, if at any point you feel like you've learned something, I want you to yell out, give me a chicken. Let, let's practice. Give me a chicken. <laughs> and we'll have the learning chicken with us. Now, if you don't do it, I might find a couple of moments to put it in there myself, you know, but call on me. Let me know when you're feeling inspired and you need the learning chicken to show up. So we're here today to talk about uh, shoes, but the motivation behind some of this talk and, and behind this piece of software called Shoes is really answering a question that I hear from beginning programmers a lot of where do I start? There are so many different ways that you can approach computing today. You know, a common thing that uh, somebody might recommend is uh, web. Right? Like, everybody's got a browser on their computer. Everybody can write some HTML and JavaScript. And that is a great starting place, but man, taking a step past that, getting into servers and HTTP, and like, there's a lot there for a beginner to try to cope with when they're just learning the basic structure of programming. You know, it's, it's even worse if you're talking mobile, like it would be a natural thing. I want to put something on this phone that I spend all of my time staring at, but that's, that's even harder. You've got all the IDEs and you know, the statically typed languages and things that, that come into play. That's, it really is difficult for somebody to start from there. So today, I want to propose to you a radical idea. Maybe a little too radical, but there's another place we can write computer programs that run on our desktop. <laughs> Zach? I don't know. Is that a chicken? Is that a chicken for anyone? The fact, like, we can run programs right there. The immediacy of that feedback that we can get. And, you know, so this is not a bad idea. Um, but if you're like me and you've ever tried to do some GUI programming or done desktop programming, a lot of it looks kind of like this. You know, this is not to pick on Java. I've seen very equivalent stuff in C++ and C Sharp and even some of the Ruby libraries that are out there that bind these low-level GUI pieces. You know, they're, they're kind of ugly and really hard to, hard to look at, hard to write. And if you're just coping with programming, this would be a really difficult thing uh, to try to get to. So into that space, that's where Shoes comes in. Shoes is a GUI toolkit for Ruby. It's basically a DSL for making it pleasant and easy to write GUI applications that can run on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's cross-platform because we want everybody with any sort of computer that they might come to the table with to be able to write these programs. So. To get the current version of Shoes, Shoes 4, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, it needs JRuby, so you got to go use your Ruby manager of choice and get yourself a copy of that. And then you gem install Shoes. Right now, it's still at a pre-release state. And then you can just say Shoes and point it at a Ruby file that has a Shoes application in it, and it'll go and run it for you. 
So let's take a look at what shoes applications actually look like and, and compare and contrast this to uh, that example that we had before of what older GUI programming looks like. Here we have the minimal shoes application. You say shoes.app to start the thing up, you give it a block. We make heavy use of the block construct in, Ru uh, in Ruby to uh, do different things. And so that block will run and whatever happens inside of it's your application. Right now it's empty, um, but we can see uh, this is a shoes application itself that I'm presenting with, so I can run this code live for you. And that's what it looks like, not the spotlight search. It looks like that. So we have an empty window in two lines of code. I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel like that's a chicken. Is that a chicken? Two lines of code to get a, a window? <laughs> all right. So, you know, empty windows are all well and good, but that's not going to keep someone entertained for more than two or three hours. Um, so we want to put something into that window. One of the basic primitives that you have in, in uh, GUI applications is text. Uh, Shoes provides a number of different helpers to kind of let you show text at different sizes. There's ways of controlling all of the styling of this that we'll look at later, but it gives you some uh, simple things right out of the gate. So if we run this application, we see three pieces of text, one in the title size, one in the tagline size, and one in the paragraph size. And that's all you need to do to start putting content into one of your windows. Again, you know, putting text into a window is only going to keep people amused for so long. Eventually, they're going to want to interact with their program. And uh, this is one of those spots where Shoes uses Ruby's block con construct beautifully, I feel like. Uh, rather than having to like set up anonymous functions and do all sorts of uh, shenanigans like that, you just call the button method, give it the text of the button that you want, and then the block is what happens when that gets clicked. Perfectly natural. Uh, shoes provides an alert method, brings up an alert box. So let's see what this looks like. All right, we have our click button. Will I click it? Sure. And when we click, we get our alert. Now that's all well and good, but eventually you want input from the outside world. You want people to be able to put things into your, uh, into your program. And there's uh, all of the basic form elements that you would expect are, are in shoes. This example uses the edit line, which is a single line text box. We assign that object for that edit line into a variable, and then we can see how we can use that later inside of our block. So that variable uh, follows Ruby's normal scoping rules, and so when we click this button, it will alert us with the text that we put into that box. And so we'll say, what, huh? All right, and when we click it, we get the alert the way that you would expect. I will give you a chicken. I mean, and, and I don't mean to belabor the point, but like this, this sort of stuff takes a lot of wire up in a lot of other GUI frameworks. This is not much code, and it, it pretty much just does what it says. I, I love that. So eventually, if you're making an application, you're going to care about how things are laid out. And choose, well, you can uh, position things explicitly on the screen by pixel value. You can put every single control exactly where you want it to be. Uh, that gets a little onerous. And so Shoes provides a couple of things called stacks and flows that will control how the elements that are inside of those are laid out. Stacks will arrange things vertically. So each element gets on its own line and things are placed below it. Um, so in our case, we've got all of these banner text bits, and they are stacked. Flows do the opposite. They flow things across the screen and then wrap to the next line when they hit the edge. So here we will have enough room in our window to show those all the way across, but if we scrunch the window shorter, then the elements move down. The text elements will break across the line. Things like a button would just hop down when it can't fit. Uh, but it very naturally flows, a little bit like things do in HTML, um, but without me having to put like five div tags and a clear both on something that I don't understand. So shoes is driven off of 
a lot of styling properties that all of the elements have. So here's an example of how you access that. Again, uses Ruby's hash syntax uh, on methods to very naturally let you access those, those bits. You can set the font, the color, the size. All of the elements have a lot of properties that are documented fairly well. Uh, they'll get better documented before the final release. Um, and this looks like that. So pretty much anything that you want to control in there, you have the capability to. <laughs> Thank you. So these are all well and good, um, but the other thing that I've, I've found, uh, I've done a fair amount of programming with my kids and, and some of their classmates using shoes. And you know, text and text boxes and buttons are fun, but a lot of kids like to draw. They like to, to make pictures, to, to put things on the screen. And shoes provide some basic things that make that fairly easy as well. A lot of the, the typical shapes that you would run into are supported directly with methods. Uh, so this makes a rectangle and an oval and a star. And we can see as well I'm using fill, which dictates the color that goes into that. My daughter has spent so many hours picking the colors for the objects that we're putting into our shoes programs. It's, it's not even funny. I think she likes that more than the actual programming. Um, but you can very quickly lay these objects out and have them uh, show up on screen. And so this application looks like this. You can see as well that when the shapes overlap or when the order that they're written in the shoes program is the order in which they're drawn and things will kind of overlap over each other. And this is a really powerful thing for kids to start understanding. It gives them a little bit of procedural thought, right, about the order that we do things in changes how it displays on the screen. So if I want to put something on top of another shape, I need to order those in a certain way. Which brings us to probably my favorite contribution to open source ever. Um, this is one of the samples that's in the shoes project that my daughter and I did. And she worked, did most of the work of figuring out what the shapes were to put this together. And it was a great exercise for her in thinking about how to take a picture that she wanted to draw and decompose it into each of the little component parts and put those together. And there's what it looks like. This chicken is for Cora. <laughs> she was disappointed that I'm not on the live stream today, so she'll, she'll get the video eventually. She'll appreciate the chicken, thank you. So that's a brief tour of uh, a couple of the most important things that are in the Shoes DSL. There's a lot more. There's ways that you can make widgets, there's animations, there's lots of other form sort of elements that we haven't discussed. Um, so, it, there's a lot there to play with. Let's demo a couple more sophisticated things that we can do. Uh, so, this is one of my favorites. I just, I love how the very simple act of drawing these ovals with a little bit of opacity uh, stacks and, and gives this kind of cool effect. It's, it's actually, this is only like a six or seven line shoes program and it, it draws a pretty interesting image. Um, games are obviously a huge motivator, like uh, probably a quarter of the, the shoes samples, uh, the sophisticated ones at least, are games of some sort. So we have a tic-tac-toe program we can do. I'm really bad at tic-tac-toe. Should probably practice that a little more. And then one of my other favorite ones when I'm testing the samples, working on it is Tetris. I find myself like playing the game when it pops up instead of continuing my testing. I, I've never had a problem with this sample, but I test it really, really thoroughly whenever it comes up. Um, I don't know, I'm tempted to just play Tetris for a while here, but I'll, I'll move on, it's probably best. So there's a lot of things that you can do with, with all of those basic pieces that we talked about, but one of the other cool parts about shoes is the packaging. So if you're a beginning programmer, like getting your program into somebody else's hands can actually be a real pain. Like distributing software is hard. Um, so Shoes provides a system for making that a little bit easier. With the, uh, with the Shoes gem, uh, you can give it a package command, and then you can ask Mac, Windows, or Linux, and point it at your Shoes application file, and it will generate an appropriate uh, application bundle for that particular platform. This also works cross-platform. 
So if you are on a Mac, you can make the Windows version. You don't need to be compiling on a Windows machine. If you want to distribute it to your friends who are running something different, all of that is totally supported out of the box. And that is harder than you would think it is to actually make happen. <laughs> So those shoes packages come out the other end as uh, uh, compressed files, star GZs, or zips, whatever's appropriate uh, for the different operating systems. And here's an example of one of those unzipped on my Mac. It just looks like an application. Uh, the Mac is probably, it's the one that's given us the best polish. Uh, there's still work to do on Windows and Linux to make those as native as we'd like them to, but there's a runnable thing uh, that you can ship to each of those platforms. So that's what Shoes is. Like to me, the heart of it is this simple DSL and the packaging to make it easy for you to share your work with your friends. But part of why I care about Shoes as well is its history. Uh, so Shoes was a project from a, a guy named Why the Lucky Stiff. Uh, who here has heard of him? Okay, quite a, quite a few, but I'm, I'm glad to see that not everyone has, because I think he, uh, he He's not around anymore in the Ruby community, and I think it's worth talking about his work. Um, one of his big projects that he did was called Hackity Hack. And Hackity Hack is a kids programming environment uh, intended for you know, uh, beginners to kind of get started in GUI programming. And Hackity Hack was built with shoes and built to let people run shoes programs. Um, this was one of many projects that Y did back in the day. Um, but this is the one that, for me, kind of uh, hits home the most. But as I mentioned, Y is uh, no longer with the Ruby community. In 2009, he up and disappeared, deleted his code, dropped his website, was gone. Um, fortunately, thanks to Git and various other things, people had copies of his code and some of his, his projects. But you know, many of them kind of fell into some disrepair, and I think for folks that may have been around, you may be surprised to hear that Shoes is actually still alive <laughs> after Y disappeared. A lot of folks assumed that that was sort of the end of the picture. But some interesting things did happen in, in the post-Y era with Shoes. Um, what the, the Shoes code base that, that uh, Y left behind was a lot of very complicated native C code with a thin layer of Ruby on top of it. It was not super maintainable. It became very hard to compile it as time went on on new operating systems. Um, and it was really difficult for people to manage. But people loved shoes. Like, people loved this DSL, this simplicity that it brought. And a proliferation of shoes came out of uh, that gap after him. There was a green shoes rewrite, which used GTK to back it, uh, a graphics toolkit. Uh, there was Blue Shoes, which did a similar thing with QT. There was a SWT swing version uh, that was run based on the JVM. This actually is kind of the predecessor to what became Shoes 4. There was HTML and JavaScript versions uh, of this that came out. Uh, another SWT clone called Purple Shoes. A CoffeeScript version, if you didn't like writing JavaScript, like there was just this burst of different people trying to accomplish the same thing that Shoes was, but do it in a more maintainable way, a way that uh, folks would be able to carry forward. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not that keen to write native uh, cross-platform GUI C code. Um, there were so many options, and eventually this kind of community that was around Shoes did consolidate, and they consolidated down and started the Shoes 4 project. Now, rewrites are often fraught with peril. It's, it's a tough thing to take something and try to redo it from scratch. But in this case, it, it seemed necessary. It seemed like the way that uh, the project needed to go to give something maintainable for the future. So part of that is obviously the cross-platform nature of, of the beast. Like, we want some way to simply have cross-platform UI support. And it turns out that one of the best places to get that is Java. Java is craft platform. Java does all of this hard work to make things work on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and they have these things built into the box. 
And fortunately, with JRuby, that's very accessible to us from RubyLand. This allowed Shoes4 to be built on top of a, a very robust uh, cross-platform UI system, but still have Shoes be written entirely in Ruby. Ruby that is accessible to any one of you in this room. If you crack open pretty much any file in Shoes4, it's gonna look like Ruby code. The naming might be a little different than you're used to in a few corners, but otherwise, it's just Ruby. And I am super happy to announce Shoes4 started in 2012. And just last weekend, we finally got out the first release candidate for it. And I feel like that's a chicken moment for me. It has been a long time coming and I'm super excited. So grab your JRuby, go install it, file bugs. Um, I'm hoping that we can hit the full release maybe by sometime around New Year. Um, and it's exciting times for shoes. While that was going on though, uh, an interesting thing happened. A lot of folks that were in the kind of shoes community had tried to carry wise code forward and I mean, had trouble even getting it to compile in some cases. But people stepped up. People, people loved Shoes. They loved what was there. And uh, so Shoes 3 actually gathered a couple of maintainers and has kept alive. Uh, they have been able to make it a lot more uh, stable in terms of being able to build it for their platforms. They've even introduced some new features. Um, and so Shoes 3 is also a continuing project that is around. It, continues to be largely written in C, so that's, uh, that's one of the trade-offs. If you're looking to contribute to it and you're a Rubyist, uh, it may be easier to contribute in Shoes 4. It does have some advantages as well, like it can run on a Raspberry Pi because it is a, a more of an MRI-based thing and JVM's memory and CPU consumption is a little much for a Pi to run just yet. Um, and this is another thing that I'm super happy to announce. Um, for a while, the Shoes 3 team had been off in their own org. They had kind of had a fork that was running. Um, but we are all back together in the Shoes org now. So Shoes 3 and Shoes 4, both of the working supported code bases uh, for giving us this lovely DSL that we all, uh, all want, are all in the Shoes org. Hmm? Chicken. All right. So let's talk for just a minute about Shoes 4. So I, I'm saying, hey, it's all Ruby. This is something that, that you could take a look at. Uh, so let's give us a little snippet tour of how the code's laid out in case you want to get in there and dig around. So Shoes 4 is kind of a, uh, a, a mono repo sort of set up a little like Rails, um, if you've looked at it, where multiple gems are all present in the same repository. The main gem is called Shoes. Uh, but this gem doesn't really actually do much. It's pretty much just a meta gem that installs the other dependencies and has a small amount of the executable, like the shoes executable that you get, uh, that you run from your command line comes from here, but very little else. The main guts of shoes is in two packages right now, one called shoes core and one called shoes SWT. And this we refer to in the team as the, the DSL layer and the back end. And one of the explicit goals of Shoes4 was to make that separation, to have the DSL that the user interacts with and the code to support that be something that's not inextricably bound to the particular GUI platform that we're working on. So the dream is that if somebody came along and they're like, you know, I would love to have this work on mobile, or I would like this to target an Electron app, and spit JavaScript out the back end of it, or um, some other way of actually rendering shoes onto the screen, they would be able to provide an alternate gem for the back end, replace the shoes SWT with their own thing, and have a well-specced out way of interacting with the DSL. So we're set up for the future. If we ever decide that SWT is not the thing that we want, there's an easier, better way, or a different way of doing it, uh, that is something that we can approach from the architecture that's been set up. So 
as often happens in the Ruby community, this is built off of other people's efforts. Uh, there was an SWT gem that does a lot of nice wrapping of the lower level Java primitives for us, and we pull that in. And so we're very grateful to that project, which has been uh, sort of the bedrock of our interaction at that level. The packaging support has its own gem. Uh, so it's called Shoes Package, but this is built primarily off of Warbler, which is a piece of technology in JRuby that allows for packaging up your Ruby code into a single uh, Java jar file. So that's kind of the unit that we pack around. Um, Warbler does a lot of great work for us. It, all that it generates is jar files, and that doesn't look like an application. It doesn't look like a native application for people on their particular uh, machine and OS. So for that, there is another project in Shoes called Furoshiki. And this is kind of a layer on top of Warbler that does the OS-specific packaging. It knows how to make something look like a Mac app from a jar file that you provide it. And while the only client of this that I'm aware of is Shoes, this was actually built to be usable by other people. If you have JRuby-based code that you wanted to package up as a native-looking application, uh, you might want to give it a look. Last but not least, uh, our manual is also extracted to an entirely separate gem. This has all the content and the code for being able to run it. This allows us to do things like share that content between our website and have it as an interactive manual that runs uh, as, obviously, a shoes application. So that's a lot about what shoes is. I want to talk for just a minute and encourage you all to kick something back. And, you know, the Ruby community provides so many benefits to all of us. There's so much amazing stuff that you can just go to a website and download and type a command in your, your terminal and suddenly you have, you know, software that honestly 10 years ago I couldn't imagine <laughs> would be at my fingertips. And it's a great thing if you can find places uh, to get involved and to kick a little back to projects and things that are out there. It's also a really fun way to learn new skills um, and uh, get more comfortable with writing code that isn't necessarily the thing that you do in your day job. And I feel like Shoes is a really interesting candidate for that. I'd encourage you to, to maybe take a look and consider getting involved. Uh, we have a newcomer friendly tag on our issues. Um, and so there's a few that are out there that are a little more tractable uh, for, for folks just wanting to get in. It's, it's an interesting different place. Like if you've mainly written Rails code or you've mainly written web-focused sorts of applications, uh, desktop GUI software is different. Um, it's, it's still Ruby, but it's a different approach to things and a different mindset. Uh, so it's worth considering uh, getting into. And whether you do or not, you know, I, my last big announcement about the Shoes Project is that I have stickers <laughs> for the Shoes 4 uh, release. Uh, we got a new logo designed, and I have stickers of the classic Shoes logo uh, for those that have some nostalgia there. So uh, come up and talk to me and uh, ask for a Shoes sticker. And that's all I got. Thank you. So the question was whether the Shoes Core DSL uh, is decoupled enough to, from the JVM to be able to run on Shoes 3. Um, it is definitely decoupled enough from the JVM that it could run on any Ruby version. Uh, we, it, there's nothing JVM specific um, in it. It talks to a certain namespace for backend classes and all of the stuff that's JVM specific is behind those other classes. Um, I, Knowing a little bit about how Shoes 3 is laid out, I think it's unlikely that they would actually use it in that way. Um, there's just too much invested in how the native code binds to those other pieces. There has been discussion of whether we could share some spec suites, um, some of the testing that we have and some of those pieces. So uh, there's, there's definitely some ground for sharing things between the projects. Um, so we just got back together in the same org, so I don't know if renaming is, uh, is high on the priority list, but yeah, it's, it's a little confusing, so it's worth, uh, worth us thinking about. 
Yeah, uh, the question was whether uh, Shoes 4 will download VMs and add them to the package, and the answer is yes. So it will try to use a JVM that's locally installed um, out of the box. If it doesn't find that, we have a copy that we will pull down and use locally, and everything else that it needs is inside of the package. Um, so what are you meaning native libraries or? So Ruby libraries are definitely supported. So gems get into the package. So gems are pulled in into the thing that Warbler puts together. Um, if you had something that you know did some sort of FFI out to a native library, I don't think Warbler would see that and pick it up. So it probably would not uh, fully, you know, do all of the things. But that's a that's a really great question. Yeah. So the question is uh, sort of the difference between shoes and Electron. Um, I mean. So I haven't done a lot of Electron development, so I can't speak deeply to it. Um, I feel like Electron is largely, I mean, you have everything that the browser provides sort of available there inside of, uh, inside of those Electron apps. Shoes is a lot more constrained. It's a lot more opinionated. It's trying to give you a very simple way of getting started. So uh, like if you were wanting to do something with a lot of really intense, super precise layout, mm, it, shoes may not be the right choice, um, but it is very simple to get started. Um, and, you know, it's Ruby. I think for me, that's also part of the draw is that just as a language, I enjoy Ruby and I like it for beginners um, in a way that I haven't found JavaScript to be quite as, uh, quite as simple. Like I could sit with my daughter when she was six years old and kind of dictate writing some Ruby and it kind of made a little sense to her where JavaScript would have been much more of a stretch for her. Oh, did I make the presentation with shoes? Yes, in fact, this is using a library called Wingtips, uh, which is a presentation library built on shoes, so you can write your stuff, like. <laughs> so, it, and as you saw, since it's a shoes app, it can run shoes code. And it's Ruby, so you could potentially find ways to run other uh, example Ruby code. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, so the question was whether there's an easy way to like uh, capture what's on the screen. Um, I think it would play well with native sort of OS stuff. We haven't built anything in, although I had had that thought of like, oh, we ought to have like a screen capture method that you just could call and would you know save an image for you. Um, I'll need to do that to like. I feel like I should make a PDF of these slides, but that's a little, yeah, a, a, a little different. Um, but. So the question is uh, what other sort of production uses uh, there might be out there. I have heard of people writing sort of like little utilities uh, for work, um, you know, like a network monitoring thing or something where you need to, you know, hook up to some internal system. Um, I, that's about the extent of it. I haven't heard a lot of folks uh, putting it into real practice, but you know, the packaging side of it was what was really attractive in those cases that I have heard. Like being able to just make a thing that you tell somebody to just go drop on their computer and run it um, was uh, kind of the selling point for it in that case. So it's, I would love to see it, but uh, I, I don't know that it's there yet. That said, every once in a while, I run across things and I'm like, oh, some I didn't know that they were doing that with shoes. Like, there's a lot of people out there that I think are using some of these pieces and may not be like chiming back on the repo or filing issues, which is the only way that I would know that they're using it at all. So, so uh, the question is whether there are any learning curriculums uh, using shoes. I'm not really aware of any except for a small amount of tutorials that are in Hackity Hack itself. Um, so it's, uh, it could be out there. Again, you know, I don't get magically notified whenever someone does something. Uh, so if anyone does know of it or has heard about things, please uh, ping me. And I think that's probably about time. So thank you so much for your attention.